Right. My, my intention today is to, to finish talking about seesaws and hopefully start into talking about wheels. And starting you know, back to, to seesaws, it, it, under that context, we can look at all the world of rotation. And so that was my, uh, the physics that I'm digging out of seesaws. So let, me, let me remind you that, that with a seesaw uh, itself, you know, what, what's going on? So this is a, a simple version of a seesaw, and they're becoming rarer in the real world, alas. You know, the toy that I suspect it's a little too dangerous or something that, that uh, playgrounds have removed them. Either that or it's too boring. But if you get two kids that are the same weight and put them on opposite ends of the seesaw at the same distances from the pivot, the thing balances. And what does it mean to balance? Um, I could come back to that. Let me just tell you that, that it's, it's a, a system that experiences no torques due to gravity. So, so that gravity is pulling down on stuff. But amazingly enough, there is no influence that causes rotation to change. So if one kid is rotating down, the other one rotating up, it, when it's balanced, it just coasts rotationally. I, I will come back to that um, if I don't remind me. But the point is that, that two kids can balance a seesaw when they sit at opposite ends, equal distances from the pivot. On occasion, though, you end up with a big kid and a little kid, uh, or maybe a parent and a little kid. And a parent by themselves, or a big kid by themselves, will turn the little kid into an astronaut, which is not so good. And this may be why there are not so many <laughs> seesaws left. But it turns out that the big kid and the little kid can play seesaw if the big kid is willing to sit very close to the pivot. So somehow, this sort of arrangement allows for, for balance again. Again, you've got a system where, th where there's gravity's not exerting an overall torque on, on the uh, seesaw. We're, we're close. I, you know, obviously, I can keep adjusting until I get it spot on, but you know, good enough. All right. So why that all works, that's part of the goal of, of today. So just to remind you where I, where I hope I left off last time, the things that I tried to convey to you is, first off, in the world of rotation, uh, to step even further back, rotation is a natural type of movement that is not completely different and independent of translation, going somewhere. You can describe a translating object in terms of ro ro rotational uh, physical quantities. You can describe a rotating object in terms of translational physical quantities. It's just convenient to pick, pick one and, and stick with it. And there are certain types of motion that are way better described by translational motion, like me walking like this at constant velocity. It's so much easier to talk about it as constant velocity instead of some horrible rotational uh, situation around some pivot. Uh, same with rotation. This motion which is ultimately the kind of motion that the seesaw goes through, is way more easily described in terms of the physical quantities of rotation. So coming back to this, in the world of rotation, there is inertia. Here it is. If I get this thing going and don't expose it to any influences that affect rotation, it rotates at constant angular velocity. Now, that's a rotational version of Newton's first law. But I've left a couple words out. And rotation's got some complexity to it. And the complexity that shows up in Newton's first law of rotational motion are the object that we're paying attention to has to be a rigid object, the one that cannot change shape. If it can change shape, it can, as we'll see, it can change its rotational mass, which causes weird things to happen. And the other thing about it is it's not allowed to wobble. What is wobbling? Well, if I get, get this, this guy rotating, and it's, it's kind of a lopsided object, if I get it rotating, it'll tend to rotate a, about a, a point somewhere near the head, and the, the handle will wobble around weirdly. And that kind of motion is complicated. So objects that can change shape or that can wobble, and are wobbling, 
just aren't covered by Newton's first law of rotation. Uh, they just, you know, makes life simple. You just exclude them. And then if you've got a system that it, it, rigid, not wobbling, hey, it can coast, it, but coast rotationally. All right, so far? That leads to things like if this bar is experiencing no torque, which is to say no influence that affects rotational motion, so no net torque, what is it doing? Well, don't uh, assume it's, it's, you know, one could assume it's horizontal and motionless. No, that's a possibility, but it's not the only possibility. It could be tilted and motionless. But that's also not the only possibility. It could also be moving at constant angular velocity. So an object that's free of, of that has no, zero net torque on it moves at constant angular velocity if it's, if it's not rigid, and, if it's rigid and not wobbling. OK? To ex part of the time, the seesaw does this. Uh, the, p the kids on the seesaw, when they lean in and out, they're violating the rigid story. So anyway, uh, you've got inertia. Let me remind you of the five physical quantities for rotation. They're, they're analogous to the five physical quantities for translation. So there's an angular position, just like there's a position. It's a vector quantity because it has an amount and a direction. Remember, the direction is, is the rotisserie axis, about which you have to rotate away from whatever we've defined as, as the, by convention, as, as zero. And that rotation, and I'll come back to it, involves the right-hand rule. And I'll, I, I wanted to say, say a few more cents about it. There's then the rate at which angular position is changing with time, which is angular velocity. So, one, so if I start with some ori orientation, some angular position, and I begin to change it, now I've got angular velocity. And again, it's got an amount and a direction. Same story as position. And if my angular velocity is changing with time, I'm speeding up or slowing down. I can't, I can't, I can't talk and do things. So speeding up and slowing down, there, there's angular acceleration in there. And angular acceleration is caused by a torque. That's the influence that causes angular acceleration. So it's the rotational push or pull. In fact, it's a twist. When you twist something, you cause it to undergo angular acceleration. So I take this, this board, which is sitting here, uh, essentially free of torques. It's close, not perfect. And I exert a torque on it. I cause angular acceleration. And it resists that angular acceleration with its rotational equivalent of mass, which I am calling rotational mass to make life simple. So that's setting the stage. There's, there is a Newton's second law of rotation. And it's, it's simply that the angular, the angular acceleration is equal to the torque on the object, divide, in fact, the net torque, divided by the rotational mass. It's, it's, same, same uh, structure as, as Newton's second law for the world of translation. All right. So now some of the details in this. Uh, let me, let me, actually, I'm, I'm going to come back to torque first, because I, I said I would do this. I want to spend a few more cents about torques and things like that. Tools. So, so tools that you have in a, in, a, in a tool kit, which I think are kind of like, they're the apps of my childhood, right? You guys all have different kind of tools. All right, so these things, many of them involve torques and ap applying torques to things. And so a screwdriver, the, the point of a screwdriver, the goal of a screwdriver is to rotate, to, ca to cause something like a screw or a bolt or a nut to, to, to rotate not a nut, around, around in a circle. And because most of the objects in our everyday experience are right-handed in their threads, they, are right, they follow the right-hand rule. If you take a screwdriver and put it in a screw or, or a bolt, and you rotate it with your right hand so your fingers are turning, and you turn, the, you turn the handle in the direction of your fingers, the screw will move in the direction of your thumb, of your right hand, namely inward. There's no, you, you, you can predict this. You don't have to try both directions until you get one, the one that's right. It will happen. 
I don't think I've ever seen a left-handed uh, like wood screw. There are weird left-handed bolts. I told you about that last time, but they're so rare. Okay, so if you go this way, it's going to go in. If you go this way, it's going to come out. You got that? Hopefully that'll be useful to you somewhere down the line. I, I, I asked you a question about a jar last time. Again, jars are all right-handed threads. If you rotate it, put, you put your hand around like this and rotate the lid in the direction of your fingers, the lid goes up, namely off, 100% of the time. All right? So right-handed threads everywhere. There are other tools that exert torques on objects. Um, I, was, I, I mentioned nuts in the context of a screwdriver. Not really. N screwdrivers can't grab nuts. But, but something like this, which is a socket wrench, and there are other kinds of wrenches, grab the nut and rotate it. And again, if suppose the, the, I, I'm trying to remove a nut from this surface here. Well, I'll do it all with you. Okay? We're trying to remove a nut that's on the, on the side of this table. We want the nut to, to move toward, toward you guys, which is off. How do we do that? Rotate the, the handle in the direction of our fingers, and the nut will move in the direction of our thumb. Same thing. You, can, you know it's going to come off that way. Um, this is just a simple socket wrench. This wrench is one that measures how much torque it is exerting on the nut which is to say you're used to, you're used to scales and, and uh, devices that measure forces on things. You stand on a scale, it, it tells you how hard you're pushing down on the scale with a force. This measures how hard you're twisting something with a torque. And you might think, well, you know, what's the point of that? Um, when you are putting on, well, so when you go and have your tires rotated or you buy a new, new tires on your, on your car, they will, in all likelihood, put on the tire with nuts on, on screw threads using the right-hand rule. They will put on the nuts with a certain amount of torque. Not a lot less, not a lot more. Why? Why not a lot less? Well, not a lot less, it's going to be loose, and, and your tire is going to start to wobble eventually down as you're going down the road, which is really unpleasant and not safe. Why not more torque? Why not as much as they possibly can put on it? because they can break the bolt. And one of the things that, that people who have spent their lives building stuff, and you know, back in the old days, the tinkering on their cars, they would sort of have an intrinsic feel. This is something I always want. I, my early graduate students had the intrinsic feel, later on not so much, of how much torque could you put on a nut or a bolt before you broke it. It depends on what the, what the nut bolt's made out of. but you actually can go so much, apply so much that you can just snap the bolt right off. And if it's in your car, for example, and, you, and you, you're out on the highway and you actually break off the, the, uh, the, the stud that holds your tire on, you are really out of luck. You are stuck. Uh, fortunately, those studs on, the, on a car tire's attachment are so strong that you would have a tough time uh, going beyond the limit uh, unless you went hog wild with torque. And I still need to tell you how you produce a torque with one of these wrenches. It, and it is possible with some, some help, and I'll try to come back to this, to, to uh, go too far. OK? So real world stuff, applying torques to screws, to nuts, jars, you, know, you do it all your you know You do it a lot. OK. The other thing to talk about for a minute here is rotational mass. So when you apply a net torque to some object, it will undergo angular acceleration. The ex its resistance to that ex angular acceleration is its, its rotational mass, how much it fights you. And some objects have large rotational masses, some have small. Uh, I should say even oddly enough, the same object can have different rotational masses, or present them, if you rotate it in different ways. So uh, in the book, I have a tennis racket. You know, right here, I've got a mallet. The ma this mallet is a single object, but oddly, it has three different 
uh, uh, rotational masses, depending on how I rotate it. If I rotate it about the handle, it has a relatively small rotational mass. Why? Because most of the ordinary mass is very close to the axis of rotation, so it doesn't undergo a lot of translational acceleration, the ordinary type of acceleration when I rotate it. And I, sh I, I shake it rotationally. You okay with the idea that I'm shaking something rotationally? Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, okay? This is easy. This is not so easy. Now I've got a, a fair amount of the, of the rotation, of the ordinary mass far from the pivot. It contributes more, it contributes a lot more. There is a, there is a square of the distance involved in there, which not something you need to remember, but, but just as you, push, as you put the ordinary mass farther and farther from the pivot, it contributes more, dramatically more. Uh, there's actually also a third uh, rotational, axis, rotational uh, mass that comes about if I rotate it uh, the other way around the head. So there's, anyway, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, so I'm sweeping a lot of that detail under the rug by saying for, for, for many objects, a single rotational mass is enough of the story, good enough, okay? But you do get interesting things that show up. And so for this, I, this I actually need two volunteers. Can I have two people come and help me with this? Come on up. And one other person? Cooper? And remind me your name? Hans. Hans. Hans and Cooper. So the first thing to do is these are two, two bars. They're, they're pipes. So they've got mass inside them that you can't see. And I want you first to figure out that they have the same mass. So, sh so shake them normally. Just, just, just you know, they're, they're about the same, right? You, you can both try them. OK? Now, w each of you take one. And, when I, and you hold it in the middle. And when I say go, I want you to rotationally shake them as fast as you can. OK? Ready, set, go. There's a little difference here, right? Now swap. Ready, set, go. <laughs> so, thanks. Now, Cooper, where do you think the mass is in your pipe? Uh, in the middle of my hand. It's right in your hand. You're, whole, you're basically got it wrapped. And Hans, where do you think yours is? At the, end. At the ends. And the effect is pretty dramatic, right? Yeah. Um, thank you, guys. This is one of these demonstrations where you sort of got to do it yourself to appreciate how dramatic it is. I mean, it, it, there's probably a factor of 10 different in rotational mass, something, something like that. And it comes about because as you move the mass farther from the pivot, it contributes more because it's, it's, it is uh, each piece of, of ordinary mass actually contributes in proportion to the square of its distance from the pivot. So taking it out there, dramatic difference. You know, come up and try it. You can do it quietly while no one's watching, and it's good, okay? Uh, that, incidentally, underlies this story. Remember, I did this, this little trick here with the two, the two of you leaning out over the pool. And I'm going to hit too many toys. Uh, the two of you leaning out, who hits first? Well, this long stick, because, first of all, it's got twice the ordinary mass of this one, just because it's two sticks, right? And also, the average distance of that, or, of that additional ordinary mass is twice as far from the pivot as, as, as before. So, so the, the, this guy has twice the ordinary mass, but actually eight times the rotational mass. So again, these, this you can try quietly while no one's watching, too. This one's easy to swing back and forth. Very little rotational mass about my hand. This one, huge rotation mass. And that's why the little guy hits first. The, big, the, the very tall one has a terrible time undergoing any acceleration. Gigantic rotational mass. This, incidentally, is why tall things fall very slowly. So if you watch trees coming down, people felling trees, you know, why does the tree just go thunk? It's, it's tall, and it's got a gigantic rotational mass. And it, it falls gradually. It, as a public service announcement type story, when you are felling trees, felling trees is, is just one of these very dangerous activities. The, the YouTube is, has plenty of 
tree felling disasters to watch, some of which probably were, were not survived. Okay, when you cut a tree and it tips over, of course, if you're underneath it, you can get hit, right? But if it's a, if it's a dead tree that you're taking down and it's fragile, that is, it's, does, it can't tolerate a lot of internal forces and so on and stresses, it can speed up its fall and will happily do so by snapping somewhere part way down. It will break into two parts, one of which is now short, has a small rotational mass, it comes down fast. And the other one is just free and just falls directly down. And so trees snap like that, you know, old dead ones, and you can get clobbered by them. And there, I, you know, former colleague from the medical school who was, who was uh, he, he's, he remains in a wheelchair after the tree came down on him like that. It snapped and, and dropped. All right, so watch out for that stuff. Uh, old chimneys, they, uh, back in the, so the, the Industrial Revolution, they would tall, build very tall chimneys to, to get the smoke up high so that you didn't have to breathe it, the people downwind uh, in another community could. So when, when taking down those chimneys, if they take them down like this, they, they almost inevitably snap, same idea. So there, there's video or film footage of them doing that, going, going down and then breaking. All right. So that's the story of rotational mass. Um, one more story that I have to tell you now, and that is that a lot of the torques, the, the rotational influences, the twists that I've been presenting up here, talking about, seem to originate with a force. And that's certainly true in the seesaw story. That is, when two kids are seesawing, we'll make them back to normal, a normal pair. When they're, when they're seesawing, the torques involve a, a, a sort of a, a fundamental simple torque would be somebody sitting at the middle and twisting back and forth like that. But that's not how anybody plays seesaw. They play seesaw by exerting a force down on the, on the chair and a force down the chair. And if they, if they unbalance those forces or they move where they're pushing, closer or farther from the pivot. That's what ultimately causes the seesaw to undergo angular acceleration and go from rocking one way to rocking the other way. So the, the point is they're using forces to produce the influence that affects rotation. They're producing, using forces to produce torques. And it's OK. That works. It turns out that like everything else with rotation, it's not completely unrelated to translation. They're, they're you know, good, good friends, siblings. And so, siblings and friends, you know, sometimes. Um, it is possible and often practical to produce a torque with a force, and you can also produce a force with a torque. They, 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 they work together. And the way you produce a torque with a force is by going away from the pivot. If you push at the pivot, it doesn't do anything. The, the, your force produces no torque. You go away from the pivot, and you push, and you push carefully. You don't push toward the pivot. You push at right angles to the pivot, and that produces a torque. And one of my ways for introducing the, the idea, this idea of producing a force, producing a torque with a force, is, is how you open a door. You come, to a, you come to a door, and let's let, let it be a door, one of these doors that can swing both in or out, but it has a doorknob anyway. It's got hinges on one, on one side. And you know from, from experience, you, you, when you come to this door and you want to open it, you, if you push at the hinge end, nothing much happens. And you've done it, right? You've come to the door and you don't know which, one, which, which side is the, it opens at. You push the wrong side and, and it... Bleh. So you can't produce a force, a torque with a force if you push at the pivot. You have to come away from the pivot. And when you're away from the pivot, and you've got the doorknob now, maybe here, pushing the doorknob toward the pivot again doesn't help. Or away from the pivot again doesn't help. You've got to go to at least to some extent at right angles to that distance, oh, you've come away from the pivot, and then you push, and the door undergoes angular acceleration and opens or, or closes, OK? And what you're really doing when you do that is 
you are creating a lever arm, with, or what's, what can be called a lever arm. If I'm going to push out here, I go away from the pivot, a distance and a direction. So I've created a vector. So you can imagine, picture a little arrow going from the pivot to where I'm going to push. That's the lever arm. It is a vector. It has an amount and a direction. The amount is, is a distance. The direction is which, where you went to get to. And now you push perpendicular to that arrow, perpendicular lever arm, and you produce a, a, a torque. And that's going to be true of the seesaw. The kids on the seesaw, they come away. From, here's the pivot. This kid is, has a lever arm up to there. So, so it's half a meter long, or a foot and a half, if you like, to the right. And the kid pushes down with the kid's weight. The kid's weight allows the kid to push down. It's not literally the kid's weight, but it's the same story I told you with the, the bowling ball on the table. The kid does push down on, the, on it. And that lever arm and, and force together produce a torque. How much torque? It's the product. And, and, and this, you know, I'll tell you this, this is not one of these things you have to remember down the road, because it won't, it, it, it won't stick well. It's the distance times the force. So it's going to have units of distance force, like foot pounds, or newton meters. And that's how torque is, is recorded and measured in, in, in those units, for example. And in this case, the kid and, and uh, the lever arm conspire to exert a torque in what direction? Well, it, there is a yet another right-hand rule. It tells you which direction the torque is in. The, the lever arm, so I'm using my right hand. I follow the, the uh, lever arm with my index finger, the force with my middle finger, which is down, and my thumb is pointing in the direction of the torque. So this kid by itself is producing a torque that's away from us and will cause angular acceleration like this. And sure enough, if that's the only torque acting on the seesaw, watch. <laughs> Big angular acceleration away from us. OK? Let's set, put the second kid on. This one swallowed her gum already. She sits up there. OK. We put the second kid on. The second kid, well, I can put the second kid by the second kid's self. There. OK, now, now the second kid's there. The second kid has a lever arm to the left, and the force is down. There's my, my middle finger. It, the torque points to, my, points to you guys. And sure enough, OK, you know, anger exhaustion like that. The two of them together exert two torques on the seesaw board in opposite directions. This kid produces a torque away from us. This kid produces a torque toward us. They sum to zero. That's what that is where you get the balance con condition. The two torques cancel. All right? And I told you the amount of torque that, that a, say, a force exert, uh, produces depends on the lever arm. So if I put the big kid there, too much downward force. The, 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 that lever arm times that huge force produces a huge torque towards you, and it wins. So we moved the big kid closer to the pivot, and now, now the big kid has a short little lever arm, big force, produces the same amount of torque that the little, the little kid produces in the opposite direction, and it balances again. So that's, that's, where the, that's the origin of the, this ability of, of, of a big kid to balance a little kid if the big kid sits close. OK? And actually, in, in, if, you're actually, if you're doing seesaw, if you're playing seesaw with somebody, the way in which you get it to rock back and forth is either you put your feet on the ground occasionally and, and thereby change the force you exert on the board to, to, to unbalance those torques, or you lean. As you lean in and out, you, sh you, you, you change the lever arm and therefore unbalance the torques. So that's pretty much the story behind seesawing. Um, two things to do before I, before I leave this too much. Three things I, I'm seeing. 
I, I told you that, that it is possible to break nuts and bolts by, by uh, exerting too much torque on them. And you know, how would you do that? Most of the most situations you just don't, unless it's a really little nut or bolt. If it's a big one, like on your car, uh, with just ordinary wrenches, things like, like this, it's hard to summon up enough torque to break the nut or bolt. So what do you do? Well, anybody who's mucked around long enough with things that got stuck, you can put more lever arm on. And so this is always advised, you know, don't do this, don't do this, but hey, I've done it. This pipe, this is my standard down in the lab, I use it all the time to crank up the, the torque on something. And yes, sometimes I damage the equipment because of that. But, but, but when you go out here now, the same force that you would have exerted in close is now producing, what, about four times as much torque. And so you can break stuff. But also you can, you know, sometimes when the, when the, the nut is stuck, you, you, you got no choice. Something's going to give. Either the nut's going to come off or something's going to break. All right. That was one item to talk about. Second item to talk about. All right. I can do a question here before I get too far along. That is getting to be very old. My hair is a different color. But what can you do? This is an opportunity to think about producing a torque with a force. And so, to get Mini-Me spinning clockwise from your perspective, which way do, we, do I whack him? Any questions about the question? Let's see what you think. All right, I'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. B it is. It is hit his head to, toward the right. So if I come up here, I what I did. Done, you know, after the fact, come back here and analyze it. There's the lever arm. The force is in the direction of my middle finger, toward the right. The torque is away from us. And that causes angular acceleration away from us and angular velocity away from us. Uh, for those of you who have played any contact sport, particularly football, if you hit somebody Right in the middle, I, I, should, I should also point out, there, this pin is, well, this pin, this, uh, this pin is, is passing through a special point on this object, which I'll come back to. There's just lots of things to, to, to remember to mention. If you hit the person right at that, net, that pivot, it produces no torque. So it, so it just knocks the person backwards. It causes translation, but not rotation. If you hit them, above that pivot, you will cause uh, anger acceleration, uh, you produce a torque away from you, in the, according to this drawing, and they'll undergo anger acceleration that way. On the other hand, if you hit them low, push them low, now the, the lever arm, let's see, how can I do this? Lever arm's down, forces to your right, it's anger acceleration toward you, opposite. This makes a big difference. Oh, at least he didn't lose his head. Tough plywood. OK? Um, what I haven't mentioned, all the things that I can forget to mention, is objects, I, I've, I've talked about rotation. I've always just sort of assumed the pivot. Typically, I've stuck it, I forced it to be somewhere. Like here, there's a pin right through it. Um, most people don't have pins going through them like that. 
So what's the pivot? Well, objects do have a natural pivot. And the natural pivot has a name. It's called the center of mass. It's the, it's the point within an object that, about which all the, the rest of the, the, the mass is distributed in a, in a uniform way. Uh, it's a little complicated how that distribution works, but you can imagine that somewhere in the middle is, is this, this point. Uh, it's usually, yeah, so it's in the middle. And it is the natural pivot in the sense that if you spin, this, spin the object uh, free of all other forces and torques, you just give, give the object, a, uh, uh, give it, get it, set it spinning, it will have one point that stays put, and that's the natural, natural pivot. That is the center mass. It's, it's an inertial thing. It's, it's the place where, where the object's sort of inertia is, is centered. It has nothing to do with gravity. Right? It's, it's present there in deep space where there is no gravity. There is also a concept that, that we often use that is the effective location of an object's weight. And it's got another name. And its name is center of gravity. So I've used, there are two, word, two centers. Center of mass, which is this natural pivot, and center of gravity, which is the effective location of an object's weight. If you want to sort of simplify the object down to one, to one spot. They happen to coincide. That is, they're, they're, for, for objects here near the surface of the Earth, they're, the, they're at the same place. So Mini-Me's center of mass is, is right there. We dr drilled right through it. And Mini-Me's center of, of gravity is also there. They are different concepts. One's a gravity concept, center of gravity. One of them is an inertia concept, center of mass. That they happen to coincide just comes out of this, this observation that, that every kilogram here near, near the Earth's surface develops 9.8 newtons of weight. They go together. And so the centers go together. But they're just different. And I, and I you know, often hear or read people using one for the other and, and back and forth. And I guess that sort of, it is what it is. Uh, They're different. All right. Um, with that in mind, let me show you one other important piece of, of the story about translational and rotational uh, uh, motion. An object's, I told you, an object's center of mass is its natural pivot. And this crazy shaped object, its center of mass, the point about which all the mass is, is, is interestingly uniformly distributed, is right here with the red light, which I'll turn on. Okay, so that's its natural pivot. If I give this guy a spin, can I do this? Uh, let, me, let me show you another thing spinning, just to show you that, that I'm not making this all up about center of mass. If I get this guy spinning, there's a, there's a point right in about there that's, that's the center of mass, the natural pivot, about which it sort of stays put. I can't get rid of gravity, so I can't spin it up here in the midair. It's going to fall. But if I could, that would be that one point that stays put. Okay? Now, this guy has the one point that stays put right there. And I can now throw this guy. I'm not going to throw the mallet. It's sort of OK. And as it, uh, oops, no, nope, there we go. All right. I'm going to throw it so that, that it's rotating. And what will happen is this point, which is the center of mass, and also the center of gravity, will travel in the arc of a falling object. Remember, it, it will rise to peak height and then descend, accelerating straight down because of weight. At the same time, it coasts horizontally. So this will travel in a parabola. That's my claim, right? While this thing goes whipping around it as the object rotates. You understand the, the, the expectation? Let me try it without the lights on, off, and then I'll do the lights off. Did you get a pretty good arc from the red, from red thing? Do it. Hey, all off. Ooh. Nearly all off. OK. So objects that are, that are sort of free going through, through, uh, going through space and rotating, they are doing sort of two things at once. You can, you can decompose their seemingly complicated motion into two things. 
the center of mass slash gravity traveling in the arc of a falling object as the rest of the object rotates about that center of mass. And in this case, it was rotating because it's a rigid object and I threw it such that it was not wobbling, it was coasting inertially. So it was going around at a steady rate, steady pace, constant angular velocity. And that it, you, you see that jugglers, clubs, uh, batons at sports events and so on. Have I left anything else out of the story? No. Ah, is seesawing the same as being on a swing? It was a question that came in. And they're, they're related in the sense that if there is no gravitational torque on either of these items, it moves at constant angular velocity. So if the seesaw is balanced, which is to say it's experiencing no gravitational torques, whatever, whatever angular velocity it's got, it will keep. This again assumes nobody's moving so we don't get uh, changes in, in rotational mass. In a, in a swing, if there's no gravitational torque, then the swing moves at constant angular velocity. Well, it's hard to get that situation on a swing. Where you can get that zero uh, gravitational torque is when you're sitting right below the pivot and motionless. So you're not going to go, go away from being under that pivot. At that point, gravity is pulling you straight down. The ropes or uh, chains are pulling you straight up. There's no net force. And there's also no torque about the pivot. Uh, so it's a little bit of a boring version, of, you know, boring moment. If you come away from that point, so you, you pull, pull a kid back, for example. They're, they're, they're hanging up there, and you pull them back. I guess I could have the bowling ball do this. But you pull it back and let go. Now there actually is a lever arm. It's from the pin all the way down to the, to the ball or to the, to the kid. And there is a force, and the force isn't quite toward the pivot. It's, it's straight down, which, doesn't go, which isn't quite away from the pivot. And now there's a torque. It's not a big torque initially. Uh, if, they go, if you take them way up there, now it's a big torque. Go in close, not, you know, it's, it's a little torque. But it causes angular acceleration, and whoosh, off they go forward. They begin to rotate forward. All right. Any other questions about seesawing? I think I've done the story I wanted to do. Yeah, I can talk about, about levers. This, uh, levers are a common simple machine. I told you the other day that, that, that most of the, of the simple machines you, you encountered in K through 12 are allowing you to do, to do work with different <laughs> combinations of force and distance. What's, what, one way of looking at the seesaw is the little kid can lift the heavy kid up and down. And the little kids only got a small force to work with, their weight. So with, a, with the small force of a kid pushing down, they can cause the heavy kid to be lifted upward. But you don't get something for nothing again. The little kid has to travel a very long distance downward to lift the little kid just a little distance. So that's the concept behind a lever. And so you know, throw the seesaw out the window, and you can still have lots of opportunities to use this sort of arrangement where a, a, a little force far from the pivot with a big lever arm can produce uh, a much larger force close to the pivot. So this shows up in, you know, in a crowbar, a uh, pry bar of any sort. It shows up in, in scissors and pliers. Um, pair of pliers here. If I want to smash something, what do I want to smash? All right, it's for science. I'll smash the cap on my pen, okay? I'm going to, there's the pivot. It's enforced by a, by a pin. If I come out here far away from the pivot and push these two handles toward each other, I produce torques in the closing direction, in the direction that causes those, the, the, these two parts to get closer and these two parts to get closer. The cap of my pen 
doesn't like this. The cap of my pen is going to push outward. So I'm going to push inward and, and produce torques in the, in the closing direction. Is that okay? The cap, on the other hand, is going to push outward to produce torques in the opening direction and thereby uh, not be smushed. Because I'm way far away from the pivot as compared to the cap, I have big lever arms. So even with modest forces, I can produce a lot of torque. Whereas the cap, because it's in close to the pivot, has little lever arms. And to balance my torques, my closing torques, it has to produce huge outward forces to produce the opening torques. And I win. Okay? So this works in a plier is you do use it in scissors. You watch yourself cutting scissors, cutting, cutting paper. If you're trying to cut cardboard or something like that with your scissors, don't put the cardboard way out at the tips of the very long scissors. You're giving it too much lever arm to work with. You stick it way in close, right near the pivot, and now you can just you know, cut it, because it just it can't summon the torques to stop you. OK? With that, then, I think I'll call it a day. We'll start on wheels on Monday. <laughs>